Okay, hi everyone. Thank you, Dr. Arad, for the kind introduction. So I'm showing here the, uh, uh, some photos of cells. So these are like a pseudo fake uh, colored things um, from imaging. But you can see that they have very different cell shapes. That's obvious, right? And um, they also have different sizes. The cells come in all sort of shapes and sizes and functions. The sizes and the, the shapes, they are formed that way because they need to carry out specific functions, such as immune cells that you see at the top left, um, like, like ear cells. You know, they have very different functions. And as you know, there are many different types of cells in our body. And uh, there are different organs that are made of tissues that are made of individual cells. So there are many, many different cell types. How many cells do you think there are estimated to be? Nobody know, knows the exact number, actually. How many cells do you think there are in human body? One person, like in yourself right now, how many cells do you think you're composed of? Millions? Billions? Who thinks it's in the millions? Hundreds of millions. Billions? Hundreds of billions? What about trillions? Do you think it will go down up to trillions? Actually, it's a lot more than you think, I guess. This is only an estimate, and nobody knows how accurate this is, but this is people's estimate based on you know, body weight and how we know like, roughly the average weight of each cell. That's, about, that's what, how, what people are estimating. So that's a lot of cells. OK, what about, I said there are different, different cell types. How many cell types do you think there exist in our body? Like in the tens, in the hundreds, in the thousands. So who thinks it's in the, in the tens, like up to 100 cells, cell types? Above 100 cell types? Few hundreds? What do you think? <laughs> Few thousand? Actually, so. This is there's th thought to be 300, but actually, actually, you might not be so far off because this is, you can actually say there are many subpopulations, different, so if you say immune cells, actually there are like tens and may maybe hundreds of even immune cells. If you divide it into small categories, it actually de depends on how much resolution you're talking about. If you, so it could be in the, the thousands if you talk about the subtypes. But roughly speaking, globally speaking, about 300 cell types. So what I find personally amazing is that even though they look so differently and they function differently, um, they all have the same DNA inside the cell. Exactly this, not exactly, with age especially, they, don't become, they become a little bit different with mutations, but basically you can assume they are, at least you're born with a specific sort of DNA composition, the genome, and that doesn't really change fundamentally. And in every cell you have in the 37 trillion cells of the cells you have in the body, they all have the same DNA. So how can they produce, do, do they lead to different cell types that have different sizes, shapes, and functions? Okay, so you know about the genome, I think, by now. And we call the genome, uh, we think of the genome as like the blueprint, or I also think of it as a cookbook, like a recipe, containing all of the information that you need to make individual dishes. So you imagine one cell type is one dish, and it says in the genome, actually the book, cookbook, if you, if you turn pages, there are instructions on how to make that cell type. Okay, it's all encoded in the genome. And the genome is still not fully decoded. Like we have not been able to decode the genome yet. So we don't know exactly what each region of the genome is writing about what. We are still trying to figure out. That's what a lot of the uh, researchers like me are trying to figure out what does this mean? What is it writing about? What is it 
necessary for some of the things like the protein coding genes, which you probably have studied. So there are promoters, and then you have a, a protein coding gene. But protein coding gene mean, meaning like the DNA becomes transcribed to RNA, and then RNA becomes the protein. This is like the central dogma. But this only is encoding for about, I think it's about 10%, could be less, 10%. Let's say it's about 10% of the genome is, is writing about how to make proteins. The 90%, the rest of the genome, what it's, write, it's writing about, what it's coding for, we still don't know. It's really amazing. Um, and when people say, okay, we read the, the Human Genome Project, we read the whole genome. Actually, that's a bit of a lie. It's not completely true because not 100% of the genome was read. It's only what's readable at the time. And what's not readable is actually a lot of things like repeats. Repeats is like, uh, let's say like a virus integrates into our genome, which happens, which has happened over the, the course of evolution. And those can be like, uh, become small fragments and these can hop around the genome and insert itself in the genome. So there are many copies of the same sequences in the genome. And these are called repeats because there's, only, there's more than one copy of this specific sequences in the genome. And there's many, there's lots, more than half of the genome. Uh, no, actually, th about 30% of the genome is composed of repeated, what's called repetitive sequences. And they seem to have functions, but also we're not sure uh, completely what they're doing. And often it's been called the junk of the genome. It's called the junk junk <laughs> because it looks like it's not encoding anything, definitely not encoding proteins. But, and so people have just thought, okay, they're just junk. They're not doing anything. But in fact, this seems to be, but still this isn't undecoded. Uh, it's not decoded yet, sorry, um, part of the genome. So, so much is still unknown. So this protein coding genes, again, is only 10%. And this 10% of the genome is what is often well conserved across different species. So I used to work, I started my career in body, uh, sorry, fish and yeast, which is single cellular organism. But many of the genes, even in that single cell, tiny, tiny, very simple organism, many genes are conserved. What's not conserved are these like junk part of the genome, which a lot of things we don't know about. Okay, but what often a lot of the things that we see, like so the cells are made of proteins, and those proteins are encoded by these genes, and there are about 30,000 of them, 30,000 protein coding genes. And the rest of the genome seems to be sort of controlling, regulating which ones are uh, should be expressed, used in that cell type or not. But this is a huge sort of a coding business that we still don't, a lot of it we still don't understand. But for each cell type, uh, about, this, this can range from cell type to cell type, maybe an average, about 3,000 protein coding genes are used in any given cell. So, I'm trying to understand, I think, I, I think this is fascinating how like a cell can be created out of this huge genome and how does the cell know which protein to express to make that particular cell type because you can imagine if some things, if some critical components of the cell is missing, it will not be able to carry out this function. And it's also really interesting, like these are called phenotypes. So this is actually genetically the same DNA mice, okay? But they have both, they have a couple of difference, 
differences. Can you spot the difference here? I see at least a couple. Uh, it's a bit, the light is a bit not good, but. Yep. Um, I mean, the choreographer. Yes. The wave. Yes. So those two. So these are actually, the only difference between these two mice is that one of them has been genetically switched off for one gene. Only one, so the same DNA, the same genome, but artificially we have ways of controlling, switching on or off a gene. And in, in one of them, which is this one, um, the, it's called, I think, agouti gene has been switched off. So it cannot be expressed even though normally it does. And what it leads to is both, it's, called, it's now one of the obesity genes. It actually puts the weight. So they've been fed the same thing. They've been grow, like growing up in the same environment. They have the same genome. But by just switching one gene off, one becomes more fat, and the color of the fur changes. Okay? So this is the power of, of the, the genes. Um, and this is, in this case, is a protein coding gene. But there are many other parts of the non-coding, it's called genome also, uh, that can affect the phenotypes, that can, that can lead to phenotypes. So, you can, so I hope you can sort of appreciate that there are many different diseases in the world. Some you are born with, some you develop uh, with age and with different environment which is something I'm trying to also study. I'm interested in the biology of aging. So as we age, which I will go into a little bit later, but you know, we tend to get weaker, our immune system becomes weaker, um, physiologically we get weaker, uh, many things. We're able to fight less and we're more likely to, to develop diseases. Why is that? And I believe it is because we're not able, the, we, I mean the cells as we age, the body is not able to appropriately express the correct genes. And when we don't, a lot of the cells can no longer function well, and that leads to diseases, including cancer and many other diseases. Okay, so I talked about this, this DNA. Um, and I think you've covered a little bit of this, but do you guys know how long the DNA is in each cell? So if you, if you join, stitch all of the DNA copies you have, stretch it, join it, how long do you think it's worth from one cell, a single cell, how long? Less than, like, let's say 50 centimeters, uh, a meter, two meters, five meters, 10 meters, <laughs> or less, I don't know. What do you think? Doesn't it depend on the cell wall? The DNA is not. RNA, yes, but the DNA is the same in every single cell. So the length, if you stretch out, and strips, yeah, and just stitch them up. Isn't it like around the whole earth or something? Hmm? Around the whole earth. Around the whole earth. <laughs> you, you're getting close, but actually at a different level. So from in each cell is two meters, okay? Per cell though, do you remember how many cells we have? Yes? yes? So basically it's two times, two meters times, 37.2 trillion cells. So this is probably what you were thinking. If you stitch, if you put all of, if you take all of the DNA out of the whole body, how long is it? It's this long. <laughs> and actually it's not just one time, it's to the sun and back. Actually, this, this is like, every time I think about this, it is really shocking to me. I don't know if anybody's, in any of you is good enough in math to actually figure out how many trips that is worth. <laughs> it is a shocking 250 return trips between Earth and the Sun. This is how much DNA we uh, have in one, just this body. 
that's how much DNA we have. So how the hell are we even storing so much DNA in the tiny, tiny cell? That is about, one cell is about, on average, again, this is, depends on the cell type, but let's say in this particular example, uh, I think it's a fibroblast or something, uh, it's seven micron, micrometer, which is, a, which is 0 0.007 millimeter, and apparently that's about a tenth of a hair. Okay, that's how big or small a cell is, and we're storing two meters long of DNA. And maybe you have you learned about chromatin already? Yeah, so that is how, that is the reason why we can store two meters worth of DNA in such a small space, because they're coiled up, coiled, coiled, coiled. And, and, but around the proteins called histone proteins, and that state where the DNA is wrapped around the histone proteins, and they're often, there are eight histone proteins in the shape of a ball, actually, and it's wrapped around those. And that is called, that state, this state, wrapped state, is called the nucleosome. So the DNA, this is the naked DNA. It's very rare to find naked DNA inside the cell. Often they're covered by proteins or coiled up like this. Or, or some proteins are bound to this DNA. And so these are then wound up again to form what's called chromatin fiber. And when people first discovered how it is in this, uh, they, used, they thought maybe they were just sort of, there's no order in how the chromatin fibers are stored. And it's like basically spaghetti. Often it was drawn in the, in the textbook as spaghetti. But now actually we know there's a lot more uh, control over how the chromatin is organized in, inside the nucleus, but so much again, still is unknown. And this is an active area of research. What is controlling that extent of folding? Which bit is not folded? How, how, much, how much is it folded? And where are they placed? There is, a, there is a rule on this part of the genome should be more localized at the edge of the nucleus, just inside. The, nu the nucleus, by the nuclear membrane. Or it should be more inside the middle, which is the core of the, the nucleus, or in between. There's actually a pattern and which, which people are still trying to figure out. And how is it controlled? Still a huge field that I, I'm also very interested in. So this is the nucleosome. Um, and this is going to a little bit of details you don't really need to know but uh, it's basically sort of my expertise also. Um, so I can go quickly over this. So there are t uh, histone proteins, and within the category of histone proteins, there are different types, histone H2A, H2B, H3, H4, these are different proteins, so they have different uh, amino acids, composition of amino acids. And they make a ball, uh, so four, uh, two copies of four different histone proteins to make a, a big ball called the octoma, histone octoma. And this is the level of uh, one layer of epigenetics on, that uh, cells are controlling. This is the way the cells are controlling which gene should be on or which the gene should be off. Because when you have so much two meters of DNA and only 10% of maybe the genes in any cell, given cell is used, you have to choose and you have to tell the cell which one to use. And the reason why the cells, I guess, know, which is also encoded, this information is encoded in the genome, how to do this, is that ba basically uh, you've, I think, I've heard you learned already about methylation. Yes, methylation is a chemical, it's a chemical group um, that can basically work as a post-it note. 
not just uh, methylation, but there are many other chemical groups that function as a post-it to say, here, if you have a green color post-it, this region, you're going to be on. Red, you're going to be off. Don't express that region. These, these are marked, the genome is marked by these chemical groups. And this might help you a little bit more to like visualize, imagine it. So let's see if I can pause it. Oh no, I cannot. All right, here. So the green ball is the histone protein. Can you see? And there are eight of these to make the histone optimum. And the DNA is wrapped around the histone optimum. And the red dots, and it's a bit, again, hard to see right now, but there is this bit of the DNA is blacked out. Okay, it's blacked out, DNA is here. And that's, it's blacked out because it's, uh, it's got a methyl mark group bound to the DNA, as opposed to not to say, don't use this part of the DNA for the cell. Don't use it. For this, this cell, this region is off. But you can use this area because it's not blacked out. You can see like the methyl groups bind to the DNA. And even though it wasn't blacked out before, it will black, black it out to say, OK, now you cannot use this area to the next nucleosome. And here, this is also a methyl group, but it actually binds, a kind that can bind uh, on the histone, not the DNA, but the histone protein. And wherever those three methyl groups are localized on the histone, it will open up the sort of, uh, did you see it opening up? So the DNA is tightly uh, stuck to the, in a sense, to the histone when it's not used. But when it needs to be used, for transcription, it kind of loosens up. And that's part of the reason is because there are those uh, three different uh, methylation marks bound. And there are many <laughs> details I'm skipping here, but that's the concept, that's the idea. Um, and as you saw, I mean, this is not obviously, this is animation, but in, the, in our cells, it is constantly changing like that, constantly, constantly, constantly. It's not a static thing where some regions of the genome are always what we say closed, closed and not accessible to proteins. Other parts of the genome is uh, more uh, always open, what we call the housekeeping genes, where you, some proteins are, need to be always on, like actin, something essential for, the, for any cell type, always on. Other genes, only you need it when a, a signal from the environment comes in. Only when you need to deal with a particular environment, maybe that gene is turned on. And that one changes really fast according to the signal. So always, always. Um, and also DNA damage. When you go outside and you, or anything, alcohol, smoking, like there's so much toxic things in the environment pollutants, and that can also damage the DNA. So mutations always happening, and the cells are always trying to repair those DNAs, always, always. There's so much stuff going on in the cells. Um, we're not able to visualize such thing in, in live at the moment yet. We don't have such technology, but by you know, uh, do, using microscopes and trying to image one thing at a time, um, in cultured cells, we, kind, we know a little bit of how active the cell is inside the nucleus as well. And this is called basically sort of epigenetic regulation, how these chemical modifications are marking different parts of the genome, both on the DNA directly and the histone proteins. And this landscape, what we call this landscape, which region of the genome is on, off, is called the epigenome. So ohm, do you know ohm in Latin, what it means? Ohm, does anybody know? So it means everything. And we call this epi, the state, what we're studying is epigenetics. But the current, this state, this snapshot state, 
where this is off and this is on is called epigenome. So we're looking at where the methyl groups are in the entire genome. So, so genome is also ohm, right? Genome. One gene is gene. Every, the whole thing is the gene ohm, genome. Here is the epigenetics and the epigenome, the landscape. And that's what, what I have been studying, researching a lot from postdoc era and before. Um, and there are different ways of figuring out what is the epigenome state. And I could go into that a little bit later. But the concept of epigenome, so do you know the, the meaning of the word, the, the epi in Latin again? Epi it means above. Okay, we say epistatic. Um, so epi means above the genome, right? So you have the genome and we're putting labels, right? On top of the genome. So it's about one layer above the, the genome. So what, this is why it's called epigenome. And epigenome really is the DNA again is the same in every cell. What's different is the epigenome. And so that's why it actually forms the identity. Its epigenome is, forms an identity for each cell type. And what's really amazing is that, again, it's very, very sort of, it's not static. It's always changing, always changing. The epigenome is always changing, especially to, in, in response to the environment, okay? So when you eat, for example, a lot of things change in the body and the cells are, doing different things, they have to adapt to a different state, environment, which is intake of the food. So I also said also, you know, we haven't been able to decode the genome fully yet, and that is why there's a lot of things we don't understand how cells work and how, what is, even if we know some things or phenomena inside the cell, how do they know that? That's must have, that must be encoded in the genome, but we don't know how, where that's written or what each part is uh, saying. And the concept of the epigenome, I'll tell you a story like my friend told me when I was doing postdoc in Berkeley in California another Japanese researcher actually, he said to me, so he's a physicist, so he has no idea about biology actually. And when we were chatting, he came to me and said, he basically read something like this, like Time magazine about the epigenome. And he said, do you know what? When I, the day I found out about the concept of the epigenome, it saved my life. It like really saved me. And I was like, what are you talking about? How can the epigenome like save you? He's like, his father apparently was a bad man, terrible man. And he thought because he's obviously inherited his DNA, that he thought it was inevitable that he would eventually become a bad man himself. And he was very scared of that. But he thought it was, he was deemed to, to, to become that, that is his, you know, uh, fate to become like him, like his father. But when he found out, actually, the concept of epigenome, which is you can change, the cells can change, and you can change according to different environments, right? If you put in yourself in a bad environment, very obvious one like, uh, you know, smoking or drinking too much, that will hurt you, okay? But if you don't put yourself in that environment, you're healthier. And in a same, similar manner, uh, that goes on at every single level, mental, physical, and if you put yourself in a good environment, you're likely to become good, <laughs> very like simply speaking. And that is why providing excellent environment at school and fun environment, for example, great environment to work with friends. Imagine if you were at a school 
that is not fun, where your friends are not fun, it's not fun to interact, it, it, you, can, you can become a very different person. Okay? So that's also the same at the cellular level. And there are environmental cues to which cells are responding to. And you really can change your destiny, basically, from the cellular level. So that's one, one aspect, like take home message I want you to remember. Epigenome changes all the time. DNA does not change. Epigenome changes. And it's changing constantly, but especially to the environment, in response to the environment. And also, because it changes so much, um, I mean, this is, this is one fundamental way different cell types can be created from the same gene, genome. So I can go into the nitty gritty details, which might be too much details actually. But I will just say that there are many, many uh, epigenetic modifications, as we call it. I just mentioned about methyl group. There are many more chemical groups. And depending what makes it so complicated, and this is why we are still not even understanding 1% of what's going on inside the cell at the epigenetic level is because there are DNA methylation is just one kind. But depending on whether that same methyl group binds, whether it's at the promoter of the gene or intron of the gene or exon of the gene or intergenic, which is in between genes, uh, same methyl group can have different consequences. And this is why it's very complex. We cannot just say, because there is a methyl group, the gene's going to be off. Actually, that's not the case. Depending on where it is placed, it can be working as to promote putting the gene on. You have to put the methylation on to put the gene on. And in other regions, if the, the methylation is there, it's going to be off. So complex. Okay? So this is why we're trying to figure out the patterns and to decode. And on top of that, Histone modifications. I did a lot of this during my postdoc. Uh, man, there are four different histone types. And in fact, I haven't even talked about <laughs> variants. So there are maybe 30, 40 histone proteins as a, as a different cat, uh, type of histones. And on top of that, there are about, yeah, by, by 300, probably more. I think it's about 600 right now, <laughs> histone modifications. And in, in, this is con taking into account where a particular mark can land. So these are methyl group. It says ME is methyl group, acetyl group, AC is acetyl, phosphorylation, um, many, many different chemical groups, depending on where they are. So for example, by doing a lot of detailed, detailed analysis, which I was involved in also, on his, this is the histone octamer. There are two copies of histone H3. On histone H3, on the, on the ninth amino acid, which is a lysine, okay? If you have, we know that if, if there is an acetyl group on histone H3, lysine 9, the gene is on. We know that. This pattern we figured out, okay? And if there is um, also methylation, but in this case, Instead of acetyl group, on the very same histone H3 ninth amino acid that is lysine, and we call it H3K9, instead of acetyl group, if you have methyl group now, the gene is off. <laughs> One subtle difference, but the, that can actually, we, we find that is the trend, that the, instead of the acetyl group, uh, methylation, three of them, three methyl groups are found at that position, often the gene is switched off. And we do this tiny, tiny, basically, uh, we look at one by one, one uh, using antibodies that specifically can recognize this state, which is methylation on H3, H3, K9. <laughs> and then we, we sequence, where, are, where is the sequence? in the genome. Okay, so these regions of the genome where they have H3K9, trimethylation, all of the genes are off. Very tedious job we're doing, <laughs> one by one. And there is so much more. And yeah, 
still a lot more to go. All right, so the concept is that the DNA is, tra uh, trans is transcribed to the, transcript uh, to the RNA, but in between, there is a, this epigenome state that is controlling which DNA is going to be transcribed to RNA. And our sort of approach to analyze, to, to study, what is the state of the epigenetics? We call it epigenome. So epigenomic data is what we handle. And then what RNA is transcribed in that particular cell uh, is RNA state. And when we look up, take all of the RNAs out of the cells and we sequence these RNAs, the data is called the transcriptome. Okay? So we do transcriptomic analysis. Also, there's also proteomics. Um, all of the proteins in, in, in a sample, the data is called the proteome or the state is proteome. And so there's epigenomic analysis. Of course, there's genomic analysis, epigenomic analysis, transcriptomic analysis, proteomics analysis. There's also a lot of things, other things you can do, like metabolomics analysis, metabolome. We look at all of the what's inside our body, what the cells are producing, what's inside the cell, metabolome analysis. So many different things we can do. Uh, but yet, we're not, we're not covering everything. Any questions? We're good? Don't be shy. It's fine <laughs> to, to stop me. All right, so kind of going now into more of like um, topic I, also, I am actively working on right now, which is trying to understand what happens during this process of aging. Like, why do we age? For me, this is a very philosophical question. Why do we age? And how do we age? And um, what happens during aging? If we ha understand what happens during aging, like what is change changing? Can we become younger? Can we become youthful, which is called rejuvenation? Can we slow down or prevent getting diseases, developing diseases? Because fundamentally, this is what I believe, and I think there is very good evidence for. The reason why we become more prone for diseases as we age, and you don't maybe think about this, but you know, old people equals like frail, weak, disease prone, right? And that is true, but why is that? What is changing to your current healthy young state to like people who are in the 80s? What is the difference? Again, the DNA hasn't really fundamentally changed, okay? Some, there are some changes, but fundamentally not really, not drastic changes. So my belief is that basically as we age, and I don't know why, and this is what I'm trying to find out, the epigenome regulation, so this post marking of the genome, the ability to to do, put the post-its on the right places at the right time, that goes down. We know that, but we don't know why it goes down, why. And when that goes down, then, then because epigenome is determining, determining what RNA should be transcribed, then the transcriptome regulation is going down, okay? The, the, the kind of RNA produced in the cell is different from when you're young. And then, what is the consequence of that? Well. The, the specificity, so I told you many different cells can be 300 different cell types, but they are all producing a very specific transcriptome. That is why they can make cell type specific proteins to carry out specific functions. So imagine this becomes all like blurry, not so specific, then the cell type specific functions, so you cannot you cannot run because you don't make, you're not making enough muscles or the muscles cannot function properly. So you become frail. And that happens that every organ, not just muscles, not just eyes, brain, like everything, right? Like the lung, everything, every organ goes through this. And that actually, I believe, opens up this, what I call the state that is prone for diseases, including ability to fight viruses, as well as 
developing various diseases. Okay, so there are, I told you there are about 300 cell types, and you, you thought maybe about 1,000, which I think is on the, on the right track, more like. And because we still have not discovered, believe it or not, even though the textbooks claims, probably, that there is a list of cell types in the textbook, as if like we, we know everything already. We've dis we know all of the cell types that exist in our body. It's not true. We are still discovering, in like this year, last year, people are reporting and discovering new cell types every month, every year. Okay, so there are still many that are yet to be discovered. And this is also because it's a technological, technical issue. We have not really had tools to figure out what cell types there are in our body. And our body is very complex. The 300 different cell types, well, not all 300 cell types exist in each tissue. Each tissue has different combination of different cell types, okay? Some have more cell types, like simpler. Liver is actually one of the simpler organs than other cell types. Lung is very complex, many, many different cell types. But even just take, let's take this lung, uh, sorry, liver as an example here. It has, what, nine cell types. And before, basically, even though there are different, nine different cell types, the way that we used to study how, what is the RNA that is produced in the liver? We used to mash the whole liver, okay? Take the whole liver, mash it, and extract the RNA from all of this, which means we're mixing all these diff nine different cell types that is making up the liver, okay? So we know what RNA is produced or what the epigenome might be in the whole liver. But actually, which RNA is coming from which cell type? How would you know? There is no way of telling, actually. And this is why it has been really difficult to figure out what kind of cell types are there. People have been doing imaging, okay? So without staining, we just look at morphological differences. Okay, there seems to be about nine different cell types based on the shapes of the cells under the microscope. That kind of thing has been done. But which RNA comes from which cell type? That could not be done. Now, so this is where I go into quite technical uh, aspect of my current research. So stop me because this is very complicated, okay? If you don't understand. Again, professors cannot understand this concept at the moment because it's so new. This technology has come out in the maybe last 10 years, 10 years ago. It's become more commercialized 10 years ago. It's so new that there are very few groups in the world still that can master this technology. But it's, it's becoming more common, okay? So if you can understand this concept, you're way up there. <laughs> so I'm curious how much you can understand. All right, the concept though is simple, okay? As I said, if you mash the liver, whole liver, we don't know what cell types there are. And let's use an example of a smoothie, okay? Smoothie you make from a bunch of different fruits, okay? But if once you make the smoothie, if you buy the smoothie, would you be able to tell what's the composition of what fruits just by tasting it? Hmm? It's difficult, right? You can guess. You can guess, okay, I think there is like also wine, like you, they, they do smell, taste, like what kind, of, what kind of fruits? Yeah, you can taste strawberries, you can taste uh, pineapples, but exactly how much of what? If there's only like few of the blueberries, would you be able to tell? I don't know, some people might be able to, but to get it exactly is very difficult once you mash it up. But that's the whole concept, okay? So what we call this, technical terms, we call this smoothie the bulk, okay? And then this is single cell. Imagine each fruit is a single cell. It's, it's making up a tissue. And then before, 
what we call the conventional way of our old way, it's still, still current way, but more conventionally common way, RNA-seq, bulk RNA-seq is the smoothie, and the new technology is called the single cell analysis. Because now there is a way to figure it out. And oh yeah, this is just a basically thinking, imagine this is actually a skin, you know, there are many different cell types, and we're trying to figure out the composition of those things without breaking it apart, mashing it. And this is very important to do because especially when it comes to diseases, okay, often the diseases change shape like a state of the cells, okay? Can cancer is a very good example that might be easy to understand also. Are we good? Yeah. Um, and so when, when you get cancer, you want to know what kind of cell types are becoming cancerous, okay? And how, what is the state of that cancer? Also cells around because they also become bad. But what is the bad state in terms of the RNA? We can try to figure it out. So the concept is simple. You have a tissue that's normally composed of many, many different cell types, and you, we call it single cell dissociate. You, you dissociate into uh, single cells. Okay, without breaking them up. And this is why this, technically there's a lot of troubleshooting to, to, to te put them apart into single cells without damaging them too much. Because if you damage them, the RNA will leak out. Okay? You don't want to do that. You want to keep an intact single cell and then take RNA out from individual cell and then sequence it. Okay? Very, very technical. So, I don't know how many of you are interested or in tr like biological biological aspect versus there are maybe at the uh, towards the end at the career session also we can talk about this, but many different skills are necessary to make this happen. Just in this, there are people who really try at the experimental level come up with a protocol to to be able to do this okay in a good way. This single cell isolation, I will also show you how we do this. Very much engineering skill, okay? It's the development of microfluidics coming up with this uh, technology. Without the engineers who make this technology possible, the single cell analysis would not be possible, okay? And the sequencing, bioinformatics, we do a lot of this, analyzing the genomic DNA sequence, or in this case, the transcriptome. The, but the transcriptome RNA, we current way is we convert to DNA. We copy the RNA into DNA and sequence, read the DNA. So essentially, even though we're dealing with RNA as a starting sample, we are analyzing the DNA sequences. So this is huge amount of data. It's called bioinformatics. A lot of people in the world, so a lot of computer scientists writing lots of algorithms, scripts for us, to be enabled, for us to be able to analyze this. So there are people who develop, write programs as well as who run the scripts and then do the interpretation. Many, many different skill sets required here. Uh, but if you have biology as a background also, like to understand biology, very, very strong. But if you only do biology, this kind of thing is difficult. You need to be able to use computer skills. You need to be able to be familiar. OK, I, I wouldn't say engineering, but be able to follow um, those uh, technical aspects. So this single cell um, analysis uh, technology is the core of this new a global consortium called Human Cell Atlas. I told you we still don't know exactly what cell types there are in the body. So actually it's a, you know, Chan Zuckerberg, uh, uh, Zuckerberg, the Facebook, founder of Facebook, right? The wife of uh, Zuckerberg is, Chan, uh, is 
I think her last name is Chan. And they also in, uh, initiated a fund called Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Both of these consortiums actually basically said, look, uh, it, but in I think 50 years time, they announced we want to cure all of the diseases and we're gonna put like millions and billions of money to, towards that effort for research. So Human Cell Atlas, in conjunction with actually uh, Chan Zuckerberg, they, they, they often do a lot of things together, uh, fund things together. But the Human Cell Atlas is not a funding agency. It's a group of people who want to discover, or basically map, is an atlas, map every single cell type in our human body and where. What kind of cell types are in which tissues and where? Even within the tissue, are they at the end? What, what, what cell type are they next to? We, they want to create a Google map of the cells of our body. That's what, what, what we're trying to do, Human Cell Atlas. I'm also part of a member of Human Cell Atlas. And it's a very interesting global effort, which Japan is uh, kind of behind, I would say, <laughs> of course. Um, but we, we're trying. Um, Definitely many, and we are actually the hub of Human Cell Atlas Asia at Riken. And the, but the idea is, let's bring, well, let's try to find money in each country, but put all of our money and uh, resources and knowledge together to not really just compete across the labs, but globally, and this, co this COVID has definitely pushed this concept way more forward, like let's all, all work together, share the data um, and try to find, uh, to try to discover things, new things. But it's very simple. The idea of Human Cell Atlas is making a Google map of the cells in the entire human body. And then once we, not, we have that, when we know we have, that's a sort of a healthy state atlas. And when things go wrong with a given disease, you map it onto that and say, what is different? So compared to a healthy liver, when you have a tumor, tumor in the liver, how do they look different? If you don't have a base, fundamental base of what should be normal, you don't know what's bad, what's gone bad in the disease. And that's the sort of foundation of basic research also. Yeah. All right. So this is getting really into the data. This is not even published data from our lab yet. So the single cell data we are generating right now looks like this. Okay. And for we're making a huge atlas right now in, a, in my lab. So we're taking young and old mice. Okay, you dissect them, they dissect the tissues out. Okay, something I cannot do manually. <laughs> I, I cannot, I don't know, even at university, I don't know if you do dissection here actually, but I couldn't even dissect a frog. <laughs> it was really tough. So I cannot do this, but technicians like, you know, excel at this. You take the tissues out, you single cell dissociate and with using enzymes, and then you put it into this magic machine that has microfluidics. Okay, this is what I was talking about, engineering, uh, microfluidics, to do the magic, which I can go into na next, to make data like this. Okay? Um, and I will go into how you look at the data in a minute. So what's different from what people have been doing conventionally is that we use the same enzymatic method to dis dis dissociate single cells. People have been trying to, before the single cell omics came into uh, the field, people could do analysis by a, it's called an instrument called fax, which I will not go into in details, but it's a way of picking one cell type using a specific marker in the cell. Okay, But this is a very, very... Uh, time-consuming effort, because you have to do one by one. Whereas in the single cell data, 
bam, you get one, all of the data, all of the cell types in one go. Very, very convenient. Okay. But it's a huge amount of data. Now, life science is becoming data science, in my opinion. Okay. The days of what you're learning, I'm afraid, right now, doing pipetting, transforming, that's going to be there still, but it's going to be not everything. Like that, that basically was majority of what we do day to day in life science. Now, data, dri data driven science is taking over. Okay, so if you want to go into biology, I would definitely not suggest sticking with just pipetting. That's not going to take you very far beyond being a technician. Okay, so if you're really interested in biology, I would suggest also taking up the data aspect, okay? Data analysis, bioinformatics, it's gonna be all that in a few years, already. it's already changing. All right, so this is how we do capture single cell. There are many different methods, but this is what I use, which is called the drop, droplet method. So what it is, this is microfluidics. Do you know microfluidics? Actually, do you know the concept of microfluidics? It's basically like a little chamber, tiny, tiny channels, okay? And then you just have a pump controlling the flow rate of the liquids in this tiny chamber. So you, you can see the, um, this is actually water in oil here. So you have different channels. In this channel, oil is coming. And here, these enzymes and things are coming. Here, so these are all liquids, right? Uh, aqueous cells putting in here, and oil and water doesn't mix, so they make droplets, right? So into each droplet, you try to capture one cell, okay? But actually, the rate is that it's most of the in the most of the droplets, there isn't a, uh, a cell. So here, at the end, these are all the droplets. Here, this is like from our lab. A picture at the end. Individual one is a droplet, okay? It's formed. And in here, you see black dots. These are actually not cells. Cells you cannot really see. Here, maybe this is a cell, actually. It's tiny, really, really tiny. Like, maybe this is a cell. It's tiny in that droplet. What you see in the black uh, is actually what makes this single cell technology possible. It's the, the secret of the technology. Really amazing. Again, whoever came up with this, and this is engineering stuff. This is not really biology, OK? How to make this kind of thing is by utilizing the biology is a whole different set of skills, OK? Development of such tools. This is a bead. And on each bead surface of the bead, there is this DNA oligos. DNA is on here, OK? Like hairs of DNAs. And each one has a very complex system, which is basically a barcode system, okay? You have a DNA barcode. And by only using barcodes, we are able to follow, uh, count how many RNA, RNA eyes are there because this, uh, the barcodes are unique. So you can actually count number of RNAs and cell barcode is put on every single RNA. This basically joins the uh, RNA, okay? I don't know if you know, the RNAs, often they are polyadenylated. So if you have polyadenylated RNA, imagine this is the long RNA, it can bind to complementary polyDT, okay? That's how the RNA is captured. And on each one, then you're marking each RNA molecule with a cell barcode, okay? That's why we can combine lots and lots of uh, bees together and process them all at the same time to sequence thousands and thousands of cells. And in the data, what it looks like, how we visualize the data is like this. Again, to get to this, okay, this is called T-SME plot. There are UMAP plot. There are different, so thousands of dimensions. It's called dimension reductionism. Really, really like advanced uh, visualization method to, to, to get to this point, okay? It's very um, technical, like I, I don't understand 
the entire thing or how it's done actually. But it's basically understand that there are a lot of information here. And they were trying to visualize in a way a human being can understand what's going on. And this is one way people have developed dimensional reductions to visualize our data. And here, each dot, okay, each is a cell. So each, the information that we obtained from, uh, is represented as one dot. Here, there's about 12,000, 13,000 cells. I'm sorry. And, okay, sorry, the animation is a bit off. And each color, okay, pseudo colored, that the computer automatically colored, but you can also do your own coloring, is what we call one cluster. You can see that these cells are clustering, right? And each cluster is clustering because they have similar transcriptomic profile, okay? The closer, the more similar two different cells have similar kinds of RNA, they will cluster on a, this 2D map, map, okay? That's in terms of visualization. So I told you the transcriptomic profile this, uh, di dictated by the epigenome is a cell identity, okay? So if we're looking at all of the RNAs, we can say the ones that they cluster is basically same cell type or at least similar cell type, okay? So in here you can say one, two, three, four, five, six colors. So in this example, there are broadly speaking six different cell types in here. And we know the transcriptomes of those. And the reason why I say 300 cell types versus 1,000 is not so off, is because here we have same immune cell. Let's say we have a same immune cell A, but we have two different states, okay? One is activated, maybe in COVID. During COVID infection, this immune cell is activated, okay? But in the absence of COVID in your body, this immune cell is not activated. And it actually has a different transcriptomic profile. So you have two different states, activated and unactivated state for a given cell type. And what we're trying to do for aging, for understanding aging is how do they become different? So when we take a tissue from eight weeks old mouse, and when we take a tissue from six to 64 weeks old mouse, which is about young adults, probably about your age or 20s, okay? Eight weeks old mouse is about your age, probably, um, versus 64 weeks old. Hopefully, neither of us are that old yet. <laughs> uh, they're about mid-50s. You compare the transcriptome profile, but if you compare the transcriptome profile from you versus us, the adults, it will be different, I'm afraid. <laughs> Shockingly different, <laughs> which is scary. Um, and you can see, right, just visually, there are differences. Okay, this is how we start to get ideas of like, okay, what cell types are more affected with the age or a disease, um, and how, do, how, are they, how are they different? Okay, I think there's too much detail, so <laughs> with this, I'd like to stop the actual scientific talk, and we can, any fundamental questions or te even technical questions? Yeah. This might be a stupid question. No, it's okay. There's no such thing. Um, you said there we haven't fully I mean, decoded like the genome. If we do, what do you think will happen in the future? Like what? Like, because right now, like some of them are decoded, and we're at this point. So, what do you think will happen in the future? How do you do? You mean how will people use the information? Like also like how does like how do we use those technology to like. Cure. Like, do you think yeah. like all these diseases will go away? That's the I think goal a lot of people have by understanding, and if there are certain changes, we know that causes, for example, cancer, and we can prevent that. Or even even if it has taken place, I don't know if you know familiar with CRISPR. Do you know CRISPR? It's a genetic engineering method. 
you may be able, and people are already doing this, like, like in China, I think it's very active, you know, and, and the regulations for this kind of tampering with your genome is different, how strict it is in different countries. Um, but people are definitely already thinking and even trying to change definitely epigenetic states. So epigenetic states, we, I feel and many people feel is safer than tampering the actual genome, your own genomic sequences. But, you know, like, um, I, I, I think I, you know, it's kind of talked a lot, like especially in China, they are trying to make genetic engineering babies to, to, to create, you know, brighter babies or, or babies that are better in sports or taller babies, you know, the hair colors. And this is genetic engin modification, engineering of, of human beings actually being carried out already. So it is happening to an extent already by understanding which genes encode the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, your skin, obesity, you know, do we think, do we believe that obesity is always bad and therefore we should eliminate it? We know some of the obesity genes already. So then if there are some, and it's, it's also subtle um, genetic differences, it's not just whether it's, it's not as drastic as you have this gene or not. Most, gene, most people have it. It's just there are things called SNPs single nucleotide okay, um, polymorphism where you have one nucleotide different from other people, from the same gene. And that single change can, can, be, can make you more prone to obesity or not. I don't know if you noticed, but obesity is not just about eating too much. Some people are more, uh, uh, more prone to become obese just uh, when, you, when they're born already, okay? It's the same as height or whatever. And amazingly, actually, there is also epigenetic level where I've heard that, um, and this is I've watched on, on, on TV programs <laughs> somewhere in Japan, I think. But there are basically, when you, um, basically the state, epigenetic state of sperms, okay? can decide whether your child be, will be more obese or not, more prone to be obese, okay? If, if the father is more obese at the time of um, fertilization, okay, they're more likely, the, kid, the babies are more likely to be obese. If the father is more in shape, and this is all about probably metabolic state, epigenetic state, it's not genetic, okay? These things can also, so this environmental, of uh, differences can affect the babies, okay? So be before even like uh, talking about engineering, editing the genome, maybe we, we, there will be a lot of things like this also. Epigenetic differences, uh, environmental differences that can lead to different things. Preventing diseases also is environmental, right? So it will be a combination, people figuring out to understand what kind of things lead to what? And when it's too late, do we use genetic modification, modifying things, or epigenetic? There are many, uh, there's a lot of efforts on developing epigenetic drugs to change the epigenome landscape of, let's say, like for, uh, cancer or, and yeah. So yes, the more people find out, about how things work, the more people will try to utilize. And that is, the, that is the essentially the goal of our research. We can understand. So basic research, that, that knowledge is applied clinically to prevent or cure diseases. Um, but yeah, I think people will. And that is, at the same time, how much is too far? is a constant sort of discussion and debate that people will have to, con will continue to have, yeah. Mm. Of course, CRISPR baby is very controversial um, and uh, people 
to continue to discuss. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yep. For the um, human cell map, why are the cells visualizing that matter? What decides the shape of them, like the relationship? Yeah. So if this is based on what algorithm you use, okay, and there are many different algorithms people have developed. The shape is based on this, how similar the, the RNA transcriptome profile is. But even with the same set of data, my postdoc will have 10 different ways of visualizing the same data set. Okay? And some will look more stretched. Some will look more put together, squashed. Some will look more separated. The shapes will be completely different based on what algorithm you use. And what, uh, very, very complex, I mean, what uh, cut the parameters you use. So what do you call it a cell? If there is only one RNA transcript from supposedly one cell, do you call it a cell? We don't. So how many is enough to call it a cell? Very subjective, but we say, if there is X number of transcripts or X number of genes detected in a single cell, then we use this data as a cell and then we throw away other data. So also like depending on how many cells you use, this will look different because yeah, the clustering will be different. And yeah. Very, very complex. So then, won't that make it difficult for the data to be used by people around the world? Because I feel like everybody would have different standards by which they use it. It's definitely the case right now. <laughs> people are processing the data differently. It's not, there is no exact standard. But the reason why it's difficult to use one golden standard, and it cannot be, there's no golden standard, is because depending on the, on the sample type, and there are many sample types, okay? So there are, uh, you can imagine, we're using mouse model, but we also use clinical samples, like people samples, okay? If you go to a hospital, but you also wanted to do a similar thing. So imagine you go into a surgery, you cut out a piece of the liver, the liver is one of the most regenerative <laughs> uh, tissues, chunk of tissue, okay? But in realistic term, in the operating room, surgeon takes a chunk out and you want to use that for, an, for re research, it's the time lag for how you can store that tissue is different from when we are actually doing experiment on the bench. It's much faster, okay? So that means RNA is very prone for degradation, okay? The longer you leave it on the table, the faster RNA will degrade, you will lose that information. The sample quality here is, is a big thing, very different from sample type, globally, depending on how you get your samples. And so you have to change your parameters based on your sample type. That's why there is no golden one. The, one of the most time consuming things is to figure out what parameter we use. It's very subjective. Even with the same data set, if I ask two postdocs in the same lab, in my lab, okay, they use different tools, <laughs> they use different parameters, okay, and so it's very like gut feeling, what is right? And you have to look carefully, if I use these, if I use the cutoff of 10, 20, 30, what does it look like? Does that look close to what we expect based on what biology we already know? Well, if we don't know the biology, this is the, the thing. You know, there's a lot of AI-based machine learning algorithms. But the machine learning algorithms, it's a learning process. You have to train the data set. If you don't already have good training data set, it will not learn. <laughs> but well, so applying, we're using a lot of uh, machine learning tools, but it's not perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult. That's why bioinformatics is not just about, are you able to run a command, write up command and write, you know, run the tool. You have to run it, change the parameter, run it again, visualize it in 10 different ways, 
what is the good, best cutoff well, it's, and clean the data up beforehand, you know, yeah. It's, t uh, it's fun, apparently it's fun. <laughs> I actually don't do the manual thing, <laughs> my informatics. Um, it can be fun, but it's very tedious also. Yep. Um, kind of like the first question that was asked, but more in relation to aging. Mm. Do you think if we were to fully understand the whole concept of aging, we would ever reach like immortality? No, I think immortality is difficult. What we're aiming, at least what I'm aiming, is the fancy common popular term these days is healthy longevity. So it is the concept of like, I, I, I also, you know, uh, have the opportunity to study with a plant group. Okay, I, I think plants are also interesting, especially trees. Trees are sort of, can live for a long time unless there is a, the damage, like physical damage by the storms or something. They keep on regenerating. Um, and so the concept of can you live immort immortally? Mm. I think m mammals are designed to not because of the way we, we are more prone to DNA damages. Okay, like the plants actually are better at protecting themselves from DNA damage and repairing them better than mammals. So mammals, I think, is very philosophical, but you know, with a sort of the gain of movement, our ability to move around freely, rather than plants that are, cannot move freely. I think we have sort of exchanged that sort of, yeah, immortality card, basically. How I about like an increased lifespan then? Do you think increased lifespan is possible. Of course, in the, even in the last you know, 100 years, lifespan has increased owing to medicine and things. So lifespan can increase, but to what extent? I don't know. Some people claim we can live to like hundreds like, like they, they, they say, if we are able to like cure all diseases and this human being has the ability to, to live for hundreds of years. Um, there is an interesting cohort. So as you probably know, Japan is one of the sort of countries where they have a lot of long people who live beyond hundred. And these people are called centenarians. And there are people who live beyond 110, which uh, there is a lab group in Keio University, hospital university, who I also work with. And they have been collecting, they have been collecting samples of centenarians and super centenarians, super centenarians above age of 110 to see, you know, what is the secret of, yeah, longevity. And very difficult. And, and my collaborator has done single cell analysis of uh, blood collected from super centenarians compared to people who are like 60s. Uh, and there are some obviously differences. Actually, in this case, we don't know if the difference is because we're picking up positive sort of beneficial secret of the longevity or because they are really close to death, right? Like, what, you know, some cases we try to go back to retain, get more samples. They've already passed away one year later because they're so that close. Obviously, once you pass 110, you can go anytime. And so are we looking at the signature of death? Basically, we don't know. It's very difficult to figure out. Are these ch differences a positive one that's driving them for longevity? Or this is just because we're there towards the end of life? Very difficult <laughs> to know. Um, but uh, definitely, I think the goal, at least realistic goal, uh, is because, you know, we, more and more, I know you don't think about this yet, but we, we hear. <laughs> Once you hear, like, probably 40, you, hear, you start hearing a lot of things and things start thinking about, like, um, your health and you know, some people unfortunately even get cancer in, you know, 30s and pass away. But that likelihood keeps going up. So prevention is best. And if you can prevent those diseases, you're more likely to be able to live longer. That's why medical in interventions have put the, uh, uh, put the longevity 
uh, access longer. Um, yeah, and so nu nutri nutritious uh, science also is huge. What you eat can affect a lot, especially in later years. Um, and the ideal scenario is you, you know, you live well and for as long as you can. Even if you can extend your lifespan by 20 years, if that 20 years is mostly bed driven, bedridden, or you're taking medicines all the time and you cannot enjoy life, what's the point, right? So the healthy longevity where you can be active and happy life, and then you just go, obviously, <laughs> is, is ideal. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to achieve, I guess. And then, the, but the, also the question is like, why do people die? What's the, what's the cause of death? Ooh, this is actually not so understood. Why people die? What is the cause? You can name all, all sorts of things like, oh, the heart is becoming weaker, whatever. That's one thing. Cancer is one thing. But the exact cause of death, I think we don't still really understand. Yeah, interesting enough. Yeah. Yep. Two questions also in regards to the longevity uh, concept, and I think I want to hear this from a professional. Don't you think that while improving and developing scientific information mm -hmm. or medicine or so on for the purpose of increasing the lifespan of people, of people or their health, scientific knowledge has always been sort of available to certain populations and not to others, especially mm. higher income versus lower income. Mm. So don't you think this sort of development might increase to larger discrimination or discrepancies between different populations? Very good question. Definitely, I think, when I think, well, first thing that pops into my mind to this is the food, actually, because it turns out I think food, even beyond exercise, for example, is is sort of like the most uh, is the biggest factor that influences your health. Okay, so right now, in, term, in terms of dif income differences, food is obviously the the best food and the fresh and the ones like organic and all of this is very expensive, and and so the low income families tend to have more fast food because there's enough calories, but there's a lot of not so great things in there. Um, and so that knowledge even there, that kind of thing, I think is also, it's true, like it's right, like low income family cannot, that don't have capacity to think, you know, at that level. And anyways, they cannot afford to buy better food that's better for them, more healthier food for them. So I think the knowledge is tied to that phenomenon. I definitely think so. Um, the, the rich are the ones. Right now, the trend is that uh, you know, the rich, the millionaires, the billionaires are the ones who want to live longer as well. And the ones that they have the means to do therapies for example, to make them healthier, to live them longer. Um, so definitely, I think the gap will, will continue to be there unless we change something drastically, fundamentally. Totally true. Totally true. Yeah. Yeah. Although with the, so the availability is an issue, but the information, I think, can be there. Because obviously, for like you know today's internet, whatever uh, media, the information can be available to even the low income low income families. But what they can do with it, like so what? Even if they know if the food, if they know if better food, more expensive food is better for you, can they afford it? At the end of the day, no. So I think it's beyond just information. It's the availability, I think, and the redistribution really. Yeah. Then my other question, which is kind of unrelated, is although there are certain advantages to increasing longevity and lifespans 
in some countries like Japan or the US or really developed countries that have generally longer lifespans than others, natality rates also decrease, right? Because people are like, oh, what can I Natality rates, like rates of birth. Ah, 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 yes. So wouldn't there be a certain disadvantage to increasing lifespan at the risk of people having less children because they think they can live longer anyway? Yeah, I think so. I, I do think so. The um, so I think there's, uh, I don't know if I can cover all possible concepts here, but the, the idea of, so the other thing, the financial aspect that I haven't discussed is the healthy longevity like, is better for people, but financially for the, for the country, all these medical expenses that uh, are needed to look after people with diseases towards the end of their life is huge. And with yeah, the decreasing birth rate, of course, the amount of like tax that can go into that socially decreases too. So it actually is a benefit for the country to have uh, healthy longevity in general, because the medical costs will be drastically reduced if that is the case, if we can achieve that. And so then it is more sustainable with smaller population. But this balance is definitely not yeah, there yet. Um, the medical costs are huge right now. Yeah. Um, so prevention is definitely best. And so people are, even I think in Japan, it's, it's Shift, starting to shift a little bit, like towards the prevention idea. I mean, you know, J Japan is amazing in terms of like a annual health checkup. I haven't been, I haven't, I've only lived in UK and US, but you know, neither of those countries have su such um, annual health checkup system in place. So yeah, I think that is, that is good prevention. But other than that, I think Mm. The food again, like the Japanese food being sort of good for your health um, is coming out for sure more and more. And that's part of the reason why we have super centenarians and people who have gone through starvation period during the wars, they are living longer because we know uh, sort of uh, fasting is actually can be beneficial for you. Uh, our, our generation might not live as long as our, our previous generations. I really believe it because unless the medical intervention is, plays a bigger factor than, than those things, we, we have yet to see. Um, but the generation that we're seeing now towards the end of their lives are the ones that have gone through the war period where there was not very much food available, at least in Japan, right? And so... Um, we have, our generations have not gone through that, probably eating too much, um, which in at least the models, the mouse or the many like different animal models, um, even worms, you know, to, to flies, they've all shown that eating too much that, uh, reduces the lifespan. And uh, less food is definitely <laughs> extends the lifespan. So I'm curious, actually. <laughs> what is? Oh, are we gonna? Are many of us gonna see hundred hitting hundred or not? Um, maybe if we eat right, exercise right, maybe we can overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how has your findings and like your the process of your research like shaped your perspective and like maybe the people around you as well that has worked on the project? Like, how has your your views on things changed? How have the views, my, cha my views changed over working with other people in my lab or collaborators as well? Yeah. Very interesting. Something I, I don't generally think about. Um, hmm. Views in, on the, of the world or views of... Oh, in, the, in, my, in my field? Um, well, I think my view of the entire, where the life science research is going 
has changed over the last, since I've come to Japan, I think, which is nine years ago after my postdoc. Um, like, I think I never imagined myself to work on such data-driven approach because I was never trained. You know, I mean, you guys are way more, far more trained than I have ever been in terms of, I think, computational stuff. If you've done any kind of programming, that's way ahead of what, what I can do already. Okay, so, um, yeah. And to, to be doing this a lot, I think, I see that the trend is changing. Um, I see more and more people are able to process, do bioinformatics analysis. Japan is lagging, so you know if you were thinking of staying in Japan and want to do science, strongly encouraged to go into computational, at least be able to just experience it at least. <laughs> Try to learn. Yeah, but um, I think somebody told me recently that, what's it called, the um, computer science, is it computer science? Yeah, computer science. Like what you know, Google is developing and a lot of the com companies are developing, used to be very academic thing. Like no companies used to have that as business. It was purely academic research. But now, computer science at universities are very minor. Not many people are doing it. It's all companies now actually driving that research. And I have, I have many of my postdocs left for companies too, which was that there is a definitely a shift in the trend of career. And before, 20 years ago, it was like going, going from academia to company was like a big no-no. People looked down on you. Oh, you like, you're a traitor to the dark side, you know, money-making side <laughs> sort of thing. But actually now, a lot of companies are doing very similar research to what we are doing. And in fact, what we are doing is becoming so expensive, academia is no, no longer able to sustain it at the level that is ideal. Because you can imagine, I don't know if you can, sort of relate how powerful this kind of information can be. There is so much we are not able to even take, like, tease out of. But um, the, the ability to generate lots and lots of this kind of data from everybody, like people, this is ma like model, animal model. Imagine we can do a lot on the like, uh, people, like clinical samples. It's very powerful to understand, to advance understandings of the diseases. But there is actually, these things are too expensive to do it at that level with taxpayers' money, basically. Because academic is 90% yeah, taxpayers' money. So there's a limit to how much academia can do. Um, of course, um, there is many ways of looking at things, like pharmaceutical companies. They're sort of like, yeah, the, the dark side because they make a lot of money and that's all they're doing it for. They don't really care about the health of the people. They just care about you know, making money. Definitely part of, you know, some aspects are true, but at the same time, okay, so, but they, have, they are able to generate more uh, economical tools to carry out large scale studies and they will start also. Um, so hopefully that will contribute though to the understanding of diseases. A lot of people are there for, <clears throat> yeah. These kind of bioinformatics analysis are heavily uh, seeked skill by the companies too. Not just pharmaceutical companies, but startups uh, making drugs, um, yeah. And there is recently a, a, a sort of a, a new move in the field where Billionaires, some couple of billionaires in US. I guess it's the same concept, like the old rich people want to live longer basically, and the rich people only have the access to, to living longer. It's this kind of overlaps to that, but 
the, they, uh, they do want to live longer because they have so much fortune. They don't want to, they don't want to die yet. Um, and so they're like telling the research, like, what the hell are you doing? Speed up your research, like do more findings and make me live longer. How much do you need? You need millions? I'll give you millions. Make me live longer. That's what, like literally what they're doing. And they have just started a new thing called Altos in US. There's also a campus in Japan, uh, uh, UK, Yamanaka Sensei, the IPS Sensei is also an advisor. So there's going to be an office in Japan. Um, and they are giving researchers, they've like picked out all like the best researchers in the world and told them, for 10 years, you can have unlimited, unlimited budget, unlimited resources. If you need 100 people, you can hire 100 people. If you need millions of, for research, you're going to get re millions of your uh, money, research budget. But make me live longer, sort of thing. <laughs> that, yeah. Do you agree with fellow scientists' sort of attitude in regards to this sort of thing where they're like, accept huge sums of money yes. <laughs> at the exchange of unfair trades? I don't know if it's unfair. So the, 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 this, the, realistic, the reality is for researchers is that because it's taxpayers' money and there's a limited amount, obviously, and that amount is, of course, decided by the government, each country's government, and the scale is different. Also, how much it goes into life science versus different fields of science is different. Anyways, um, it's a hard life <laughs> to try to obtain enough budget to carry out research. And that is sort of the headache, actually, of, uh, and the researchers every day throughout the whole career. So if you are able to carry out and, you know, the research in such a free, unconstrained environment, and the, the data is anyways going to be publicly available to be shared by the rest of the world. Some, I, I don't know exactly how this place called Altos is doing it, to be honest. Some, of course, if you are working for a company or even university, sometimes you are not able to publish your findings because you want to put a patent on it. And, and there's, you know, until you have a patent on it, you don't, you cannot publish. But some people don't care about patent because they don't care about making money out of it, out of your findings. Then you just publish, make it all available, your findings to the public, and then other people can build on it or utilize that information. And so I think generally speaking, these kind of places, the idea is to make your findings available. Yeah, it's called, uh, they, uh, what's it called? It, that we, some, some institutes make it, uh, a strict rule to share your data even before publishing publicly. Yeah. Depending on the source of the money, I guess. Yeah. But it's interesting because, for example, like insulin, the mm. product was sold for a dollar. And now insulin in the US, for example, it's so expensive. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Very interesting. There are, yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, this kind of like patenting and applying, not my expertise, so I don't really know. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's one aspect, I think, public sharing the data publicly, freely accessible data, is one of the reasons why people didn't really like the industry, because they will keep it to themselves, and it's not shared. Uh, but the... Uh, at, after a certain point, the companies can also release their data after putting patent on it. Yeah. Some, sometimes it's not, but yeah. And that depends on the company. Mm. And there are many, uh, speaking of like different careers, I mean, there are many aspects like this, like regulations also of many different levels, law as well, and ethnic. Like, like um, yeah, I, sort of how fair are you being um, across different multiple of issues? 
there are like lawyers, patent lawyers, there are regulation lawyers, and yeah, many, many different routes to how you can be involved in the whole research field in many different ways, not just sort of experiments. Mm. Yep. Is it possible to like potentially accelerate aging while maintaining a same lifespan? Like so like what while they're ten, like physically like thirty? I think it's like thirty for like a longer time. So they can work more. It's like it's Benjamin Button. <laughs> Good question. I think you can. Mm, I, do we have enough data to, to, to be able to say this? Uh, right now, what I want to establish, there is a concept called biological age. It's called epigenetic clock. Okay, So you guys are all same age, I guess, similar. Okay, But your biological age might be different. Chronological age, how many years you've been living is the same. But are you all inside, same age, aging the same way? Now this is, OK, for younger people, I think it was a more difficult concept. For example, take a 60-year-old lady, OK? Two 60-year-old ladies. You often say, oh my god, you don't look like 60. You look like 50. Or it could be other, other person could be, oh, I thought you would be older. Whoops. Right? <laughs> so there are, for the same chronological age, people, people can look younger or older, and also inside. And often, I think visual actually is often reflected, but reflecting what's inside. And there is a concept now that's kind of established now. If you look at this DNA methylation state, you can correlate people with how old they are inside, actually. So by looking at, if I take my own blood, which I want to do, Actually, really, I want to make DNA methylation like data of myself and put it on the, on the curve. Where am I? Am I younger or older than my chronological age body-wise, biologically? We can actually do this. And I think you will start to see actual services from, <laughs> from now on, more and more in the next 10 years. But uh, there are certainly models that you can mouse, like, or, or animal models, where you can accelerate aging or slow down aging. And you can look at this sort of epigenetic clock. And whether, I actually not sure whether uh, like all the biological age always ends up dying earlier, most likely, but you might be able to find some particular condition where it's not necessarily the case. And that could be very dependent on the environment. So in a given environment, like for example, I haven't shown you this today, but we're using a model called germ-free mice. Now germ-free means they have no microbes, like completely germ-free, like we're covered by germs inside and out, as you probably know. There are many more, I can't remember, 10 times, 20 times more microbes in us compared, compared to how many cells we have, OK? So there is a theory like the microbes are actually, microbiome is actually controlling us theory. We, we don't, we, we, we're just like output. We're like a robot. The microbes are actually controlling us. There is this theory. <laughs> but there are so many of them. Anyways, there's, but we're, we're, we're dependent on them. Without the microbes, actually, we cannot live, OK? Especially against in this environment. We have germ-free mice that are kept in a sterile condition okay, in the bubble. These mice can live longer than the standard mouse that harbor microbes okay, in the body, but only in a sterile condition. Because, yeah, so that's why I said it's a sort of environment dependent on the environment. If you keep the germ-free mice in a sterile condition, they live longer. But if you put them into the wild, they're going to die earlier. So yeah, maybe you are able to find such condition where you're biologically older, where aging is, 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 fast, is more fast-forwarded, but uh, you could live to the same age as another one. Yeah. OK. <laughs> 
Yep. This is what the ring, so uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>